So if you guys remember in the previous lecture, uh, so this is lecture three, in the previous lecture we learned about um, centralities, different types of centralities. And actually we discussed um, how can we know what is the best centrality to use, in which case the drawbacks, the advantages of different centrality measures. And actually this is um, uh, learning how to find the best centrality measure to a particular uh, graph depends on the topology of the graph, the problem you're solving, the data you're using, how you're formalizing your problem, what is the meaning of an edge, what is the meaning of a node, etc. So if you remember, for example, here, uh, this, these two nodes can be uh, considered as uh, central nodes, but uh, it depends on the measure we'll be using, so it's very important uh, to know these measures and get the intuition behind them. So just to recap, we saw that uh, topological centrality is a multifaceted concept, which means there are, uh, there are many uh, measures that we can use okay, to quantify the centrality of a node. And also we saw that we can quantify the centrality of an edge. Like, for example, for uh, closeness centrality or betweenness centrality, we can um, compute the centrality of an edge. So this, uh, for some centrality measures, they can be easily generalized to edges, okay? Now, uh, different measures of centrality, they make different assumptions. So assumptions are very important about how information flows on the network, okay? So for you guys to know which centrality measure to use, you need to um, know these assumptions, the inherent assumptions behind each measure. Okay, and we uh, talked about this in the previous lecture. So measures based on, for example, the shortest paths, they assume that information is um, rooted along the shortest path. And this is not always the case. Okay, so we discussed that maybe sometimes there is um, uh, the most traveled path in a network starting from a node or passing uh, by a node is not, is not necessarily the shortest path. Okay, it might be uh, slightly longer. So here... Uh, in the previous lecture, we um, brainstormed about this and we said maybe we can give higher weights to shortest paths and like, you know, smaller weights to other paths and update the definition of the, uh, the closeness and between the centralities. Now, if we look at this, okay, so let's look at this graph. What do you guys know this? So here we do have... Uh, you know, like uh, a typical, a simple undirected graph. But elements or nodes in this graph, they cluster together. They're like, you know, the form different clusters. So, for example, let's say if I try, so this is, um, we can call it, for now, we can just call it a cluster, or we can call it also a group of nodes, okay? that is highly interconnected, highly interconnected, okay? So, for example, this link is a very important link between these two, uh, between these two groups or clusters that actually it is like one of the most important links that enables the communication between these two uh, groups. Now, imagine is for, if, for example, I remove one edge for, or two edges right here. What do you guys notice? That, like, there's a lot that is changing in this network. For example, where here I have two edges, but what if I remove this one and this one? What is happening to the network? Like, let's say um, these two edges get attacked. They get, for example, uh, uh, you know, like removed or broken for any reason. In biology, it might be a lesion in the brain, so a connection can get broken between two lesions. Uh, in other uh, circumstances, it might be a, a route or a path in a city that's not working anymore, right? So you cannot go through that path. So what happened to the network here when I removed those connections? It, it's disconnected, right? So now we have like kind of two different subgraphs. So like one part is still connected, this part, and another part is like basically it's now isolated. Okay. So so here 
the idea is that sometimes what we try to do is like um, we know that there are some central nodes, some important central edges uh, in in the uh, in a network. But also, if we disconnect some parts, like we're we can generalize the concept of centrality by looking at if you remember, guys, one of the one of the definitions we had last time, the delta centrality. It was seeing or evaluating the importance of a node or an edge. Well, we talk generally about a node uh, by removing it. So how removing that node would affect the integrity of the whole graph. Now imagine if, for example, I remove like a whole cluster of nodes, okay? Or I remove maybe some nodes like an edges in a particular cluster. So we can generalize the concept of centrality by not just, you know, um, disconnecting the graph, but also by removing whole clusters. So if you have important clusters in the graph, we can think about removing uh, a set of nodes instead of removing only one node. Okay, so this is something we will explore more uh, later on. But today, what we will look at uh, in this lecture is basically um, the notion or definition of connected components in a graph and also uh, the percolation and graph robustness to attack. So this is the, in the second part. So these are two interdependent. So first I will explain or introduce um, what is a connected component in a graph. So if you look at this case, at this figure, so here we do have a graph. So we say a node connected graph is a graph that has a path that can be traced between any pair of nodes by traversing the edges of the graph, okay? So in this example, let's look how many, uh, how many nodes connected, let's look at the first one, G1. So is this graph node connected? So the definition is that if I select any two nodes, random nodes in this graph, I can easily find a path that connects them, okay? So is G1 is a node connected graph. Like if you take any two random nodes, you can always find a path that connects them, okay? Is that true? Yes, okay? Now if we look at this graph, G2, what is happening to this graph? So for example, if I see these two, uh, I examine these two nodes. Can I go from, you know, this node to this node? No, right? So basically this graph, the graph G2 is not node connected. So it's, it's, it's broken, it's fragmented, it has uh, different uh, disconnected subgraphs. So graphs containing subsets of nodes that cannot be linked by a traversable path are called frag uh, fragmented or disconnected, okay? So each subset here is called a connected component. So how many connected components we have here? So it's quite easy, right? So we have like, uh, this is connected component number one, two, three, and singletons, uh, a singleton, okay, is also a connected component. So it's like just by itself. Now, uh, here, so basically a singleton is a connected component with a zero degree uh, node, so it's not connected to any other nodes. But let's look at this definition. So now what we have, we have, let's say, different connected components, and we want to look at the minimum spanning tree. So, you know, like uh, for, you guys have seen this before, minimum spanning tree, probably, yeah. So um, the minimum spanning tree uh, is the minimum set of edges required to form a node connected a network or a node connected graph. So in a binary graph, a minimum spanning tree is a subgraph comprising the minimum number of edges that ensures a path can be found between all pairs of nodes. So in a, in a binary graph like this one, if we have n minus one edges, okay, so what is the length of the MST, the minimum spanning tree of this graph? So basically it's a pathway that goes from one node and connects all other nodes in the graph. What is the, the size? How many edges in that spanning tree? If we have n nodes, it's n, n minus one, yes. So it's n minus one, giving that we have n nodes. Now, in a weighted graph, 
this is important. So generally real world applications like um, graphs are weighted. So we can assign a distance penalty or a function of the weight to each edge in the graph. And MST here basically is a subset of edges that minimizes the total sum of these penalty values subject to a path existing between all node pairs, right? So this is what actually we, we can call a foundational backbone of a graph. So MST allows you to find the backbone of a graph and this has uh, different applications. So can you guys think about an algorithm to find the MST in a weighted graph? Can you write down an algorithm on how to find the, uh, if you have a weighted graph, I have different weights here. How can we find the uh, minimum spanning tree of this graph? Okay, I'll give you a minute and try to just, you know, write down, sketch an algorithm, like the main steps. Simple, yes, quite simple. Uh, the uh, yellow hat you draw is not the minimum. No, it's not. No, no, here I'm just, you know, like, basically because it was undirected. So undirected, uh, unweighted, so you can select any path. But if we have weights, so for example, this is 8, this is 9, this is 1, and we have here maybe uh, 3, okay? And we need another weight here. How can we find the minimum spanning tree? Yes? You can start from the smallest distance edge and select it. Mm -hmm. and try to span all the graph. Then all span right. the whole graph. Yeah, so that's a very good idea. So basically, it's quite simple. So, yeah, we need to start with a small distance, for example, one. And then go to two. So add the distance, add the, the edges with the lowest weights. Uh, three without trying without forming a cycle. So here we have two options either this one or the other one and then keep on adding until we add uh, basically we traverse all the um, uh, nodes without uh, forming a cycle. So that's basically the idea. So here step one is um, this is the MST Kruskal's uh, algorithm. So first we need to select the lowest weighted edge and then add edges in ascending order without forming any cycles, okay? So this is how it works here. For example, we have uh, a first graph, so the, uh, this graph, and then we try to do this step by step, so it's quite simple. We take, for example, the lowest uh, weight here is this edge, right? And then we can do, uh, so from after two we have three, and then we can do four, right, and then four, we have five, right, six. Uh, for the six, we have two options. So I can select the other one. So here they selected this one, but I'll select this one, okay? And then uh, seven, eight. I cannot select the nine, can I? No, because if I select the nine, what's going to happen? I'll form a cycle, so I cannot do that. So then next, uh, 11, I cannot. Right, so it's 15. You guys can see. So do we have always a unique solution? No, obviously, okay?